First Samuel chapter 10. If I was to take a survey here and ask how many of us would, would want to have more faith, I would be willing to wager that nearly all of you would say, yes, <laughs> I would want to have more faith. I mean, this is a common Christian desire, a yearning that we have as believers. And so it, a lot of that desire for faith often is kind of stopped because we don't really know how to proceed and how to have more faith in our life. And so then the question, the follow-up question to would you like to have more faith would be, how do you get it? Or, you know, what's the key to having more faith? Well, faith is a purposeful thing. It's not just something that happens without your involvement. And we're going to see that as we go through this chapter. Faith is a lifestyle. So it's who we are. It's what we do. And also, faith is a necessity. It's critical in the life of a Christian. However, faith can be kind of scary. It can look like this. There was this guy who fell off of a cliff. But on his way down, he managed to grab hold of a tree limb that was sticking out of the rock. As he was hanging there from this tree limb, he said, Is anybody up there to help me? And there was a reply that said, I'm here. I am the Lord. I will help you. Do you believe me? And the guy who was hanging there said, Yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, but I can't hang on any longer. And the Lord said, That's all right. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of that branch. And then there was a moment of pause, and the man said, Is anyone else up there? (laughs) And that's kind of the life of a Christian sometimes. Because I'll admit, it's scary to trust in the Lord and to have faith in Him. Faith can be scary. It can be really scary sometimes. But God urges us to believe, to have this faith in Him, and what He said, and then follow the instructions that He gives us for our life. But I believe that in order for that to happen, that He really has to get a hold of your heart. And so the question for us to kind of uh, delve into today is has he done that? Has he gotten a hold of your heart? Because I think we're going to find out as we go through this chapter. And so just kind of the little phrase that the Lord gave me going through here is is that we want to live by faith. Living by faith. What does that look like? Is it in God in your life, in his word, or is it in something else? So that's what we're going to talk about. And let's begin chapter 10 of First Samuel verse 1. It says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, that's Saul's head, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Okay, just a quick refresher of what's been going on. Remember, Saul has been chosen to be the first king over Israel. They hadn't had a king before. God was their king, or should have been their king. And so then Saul was against what God actually wanted for them. But they, remember, they insisted that they wanted a king like the world, like all the other countries that were around them. God said, I am your king. I will help you. I will do all these things for you. I will fight your battles. And they said, no, we want a king like the other countries have. And so Saul is this king that God has chosen for them that they wanted. And so what we have here is this little private ceremony between Samuel and Saul. The first thing he does is he kisses them, which was, that's how they did things back then. It's like our handshake, our hug. He kissed him and he pours oil on his head. And this is uh, one of the things that they would do for priests in the Old Testament to consecrate them, to prepare them for that life of service that they were going to do. It's symbolic, this oil of pouring on the head and just running down your face and the beard and and everything. It's symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon this person for the work of the ministry, for what God was going to do. And just it also symbolizes that power of God. Just like when you are filled with God's Spirit and the Spirit comes upon a believer, it empowers you, it gives you direction for service in your life. And so this is a picture of that, an Old Testament image. And so it's just the two of them there, Samuel the prophet and this new king pouring the oil over his head. And later, we're going to see here that everyone finds out about this, but now it's just them. It's sort of like when someone is anointed by the Lord today. God calls that person first, chooses them, and then he equips them by the power of his spirit. 
And then, eventually, everybody else finds out about it. But initially, it's just between the Lord and that person, just like it has been in your life. God, whatever God calls you to do, He speaks to you first, begins that equipping process, and then everybody else finds out about it. Now, I like for you to just keep this ceremony in mind as we go through the book of 1 Samuel. Because when we get to David, David will not harm Saul. He just won't do it. No matter how nasty Saul is to him. And you guys know if you've read through this, Saul does some really mean things to David. But David says things like, I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. And this is why. Because David knew in his spirit that God chose him. Even though Saul is a heavily flawed individual, he's still the Lord's anointed, and David will not do that as respectful to him. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And so now we go into verses 2 through 6, and we see here three signs that are given to Saul by the Lord to confirm that he's calling him in his life. And it says, And when you have departed, this is Samuel speaking, from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There are three men going up to God uh, at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. So Samuel here lays out three things that's going to happen to Saul on his way back home. Signs that God would fulfill what has been told to him. So he's going to show him these things to to help him, to increase his faith. And they're unusual things (laughs) to confirm that it's from the Lord. He points out, you know, you'll you'll see these guys and he'll have three loaves of bread and he's going to give you two. I, I love how God is very specific in his prophecy. It's not like some who will use vague things so that you can't really verify them. It would be like if I came up here and said, I sense today that someone here is tired. What are the odds of that happening? (laughs) It's not really going out on a limb prophecy-wise. Now, God may give a prophecy like that, but he seems to be a lot more specific about that. And so I believe why we see this here and why Saul is given these three signs is to increase his faith. And that's our, our subject matter today. The life of faith. Living by faith. And God wants Saul to lead Israel by faith. And so we saw them there, these three things. The first one was back in verse 2, and it was those donkeys. Remember, Saul eventually ends up in this predicament anyway because he went looking for donkeys. They were lost. And now all of a sudden he's the king of Israel. And so God used that, those lost donkeys. And this prophecy is, is shown him saying, I want you to have faith that they're found and that God is going to help Israel with their problems. So that's the first thing that God encourages him him with so that he will grow in his faith and, and that Israel's problems are going to be helped as he goes on, as he's the king. He's going to have all kinds of issues as the king of Israel. He wants him to know it's going to be okay. God will help you. The second thing we see is in verses 3 and 4 and that it mentions the bread. And so here I think what he's talking about is that faith that God will provide for the needs of the people, the needs of you, Saul, as you're leading my people. And then verses 5 and 6, we see the Spirit. Remember, it says, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And I think that that is showing us that he's going to have faith that God will give power for service. You know, he's not going to do this alone. God is going to strengthen him, just like we saw that image of of the oil running down his head and his beard and so forth. So Saul, we're being shown, God's telling Saul, 
you don't have to do anything really. I just want you to believe in me and trust in me. And I'm going to provide all these things for you. All I want you to do is believe, Saul, and then follow instructions that I give you. And so it tells us that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be turned into another man. And so Saul is going to be significantly changed here. And we'll talk about that some more as we go. So verse 7 says, And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. So let's just stop here for a moment. What an encouragement here this is for him. I hope it is, but it's also for us too. Basically saying, make sure that you use these spiritual gifts that I give you. Make sure that you remember these things that I'm telling you to help you and that you have faith in them. And then do as the occasion demands. Notice here that Saul is not involved in the decision process of what gift he gets or these things that God's going to bless him with. God just chooses these things independent of us by his will. But then he wants our responsibility to take over from there. We have to exercise these things and to do as the occasion demands. I'm thinking about like maybe if you're in a prayer group or something or a Bible study and God gives you a word of knowledge, for example. And here you are, you've been given this gift on that moment, and God just encourages you to speak out because we need to have faith in order to do that. But oftentimes we won't exercise the gift that God gives us or something that he wants us to say because for a variety of reasons. And so it says here to do as the occasion demands. Faith to do as the occasion demands. You know, I don't really like to talk about myself a lot, and I just like to teach through the Bible and use other examples. But this one just it keeps coming to me, so I feel like I'm supposed to share it. So when I was um, before as pastor, I was teaching a home group and just kind of doing our thing, serving at the church I was at. And I just felt like the Lord was, was giving me signs to reach out to the elderly. And so, you know, thing, stuff kept happening over and over again. First of all, the Lord put it on my heart. He gave me a love for senior citizens. And so what would happen is I would be at Walmart or whatever with my wife, and I would just start, elderly people would just start chatting me up all the time. And I knew that the Lord was doing something. I just didn't really know really what it, what it was. But my wife was, would start saying, she'd be like, you are an elderly people magnet, <laughs> you know, because wherever we were at, I would start just old people talking to me. And, and so I'm just working this out. Lord, what does this look like? What, what am I supposed to do? What, you know, come to find out that I'm supposed to go uh, do these church services in rest homes. And eventually did, but uh, the one real key thing that happened to me is I was in downtown Boise, and I'm sitting in a stoplight, and I'm kind of praying, you know, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do? I, I feel like I'm supposed to do something with this, and I just need some help. And right at that moment, this bus pulls up next to my car, and it's one of those little buses that they drive around and pick up the elderly <laughs> to uh, take them to, like, shopping and stuff like that. And I look over, and, it's, and they're, like, waving at me, you know. <laughs> So I got these signs, and then it's up to me, right, to exercise, because I don't have to, you don't have to, but God wants us to be obedient to that. Faith to do as the occasion demands. Now, the Lord knows that this can be difficult, and so he addresses that too. What does he say there in verse 7 to help you, to encourage you? For God is with you. For God is with you. He's talking to Saul, obviously, directly, but this is for us too. In other words, the idea is to be faithful, to engage, to put it into gear <laughs> so you can actually go so that, and knowing that God's going to be with you and not to fear. Because here's what happens. We can tend to be overly cautious about our life, what others think. That's why we don't share the word of knowledge in a group or maybe a prophecy that God's given you something in a group of people. When I read the book of Acts, which is one of my favorite books in the Bible, there's so much, I should say, it's such a lack of being cautious in these people. They're just going and going and going and just allowing the Spirit to move. And I think that sometimes in the church, we quench the Spirit because we won't, we're overly cautious about what people think and what we're going to do and, and how we'll sound and so forth. And so it says, do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. What would you think... <laughs> If Saul said, 
well, Lord, if maybe you would show me a fourth prophecy to help me, what would we think? We'd be like, Saul, (laughs) you just don't have enough faith. But what about us? We have the entire Bible full of things like this, and yet we're just like Mr. Frozen, (laughs) cautious. We lack those things when God has already shown us through these examples what he will do and how he will help us. Now, all that said, it's important for us to also to be wise and not to be foolish with our life and what we do. Heard about this little boy who was walking down the beach and he saw an elderly woman. It's not me. <laughs> but this little boy walking down the street and he saw an elderly woman sitting under an umbrella there on the sand. And he walked up to her and he said, are you a Christian? And she said, yes, I am. And he said, do you read your Bible every day? And she nodded her head and said, yeah, I do, actually. And he said, do you pray often? And she said, yes, yes, I do. And he said, okay, good. Will you hold my quarter while I go swimming then? (laughs) And so it's okay to check things out and to make sure about things. But God wants us to exercise our gifts and to walk in faith. Be people that he can use. God is with us. So he goes on, it says in verses 8 and 9, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come back to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day all these things came to pass that day it says and this is because samuel is a true prophet of god god speaks to him samuel in faith says it and then all these things it says came to pass and you know this is how the bible tells us how to test whether a prophet is of god or not whether it's a true prophet because they must be accurate a hundred percent of the time all things must come to pass nine out of ten is very good But that's not good enough. It has to be perfect. God's prophecies are always, his prophets are always true. And this is why we reject any modern prophets who keep changing the story. And you know some who they are. This is not of God. These are false prophets. Prophets of God don't make mistakes, even little ones. They don't adjust dates and times, and so forth. And so God here, he confirms what Samuel told him. And this is a faith builder for him, and it's a faith builder for me, too. Now, we're told here in verse 9 that God gives Saul a new heart. That's really interesting to see here to me. Remember back in verse 6, it says that he was going to be turned into another man, and he is. The Holy Spirit would be upon him. And so all of these things that we're seeing here, and and, you know, when I read this, the question that I have is, has Saul been converted? Has Saul been converted? Is he a believer now? Most say, the vast majority of people who comment on this say that we cannot conclude that he's born again by faith, and for a number of reasons. That God has essentially equipped him officially just sort of preparing him to be the king. Now that seems kind of unlikely to me that God would choose a non-believer as the first king over Israel. I mean, he could, of course, but it just seems kind of unlikely that God would do that. But there's a lot written on this topic (laughs) and the debate goes back and forth quite a bit. You could probably find some of that on your own. But I wanted to just talk about for a minute the anger that I see over this issue and others that Christians dispute over in God's Word. I've noticed that people get really angry about this issue in particular. And I, when I read it and I see these things, it makes me wonder why we get angry about that. Whenever somebody gets really angry about Scripture, I think it might mean that it has gone against some sort of a deeply held doctrinal belief. Or maybe the Lord has struck a chord that affects somebody's theology. Or maybe your church statement of faith is all of a sudden being challenged by what we read. Do I all of a sudden now have to jump through some hoops in order to explain away the text? And I'm not saying that this is what these people are doing with this particular verse, but this is 
fairly common in Scripture. For some reason, we think that we have to be able to reconcile every single issue in God's Word. Or else, our belief system is not really stable. But what I've discovered in my own life is is that faith often means not being able to resolve it all. I see some heads nodding. You know what I mean? In fact, the more it's like the more that I know the Lord in my life, the less I sort of understand his ways. And I think it's kind of designed like that because he wants more faith from his people. He said to Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so do we have the faith to believe even if it goes against the way that we think it should be? Are we willing to believe this book even if it's really difficult for us to do it? St. Augustine, he said, God does not expect us to submit our faith to Him without reason, but the very limits of our reason make faith a necessity. And isn't that the truth? I need faith about some of these things because I just cannot wrap my mind around some of these subjects that are in the Bible. And I praise the Lord that I can't figure him out completely. One day, I will know these things. But now, I just some of them are just, I have to just, okay, that's what you said. And so I say all this just to say that I really don't understand what's going on here. That's a preface to this. It looks like a conversion to me. It smells like it. It looks like it. But there's problems with it. Typically, I don't know if you're like me, but typically I think the simplest explanation about biblical things is the best explanation. But here, I'm not so sure. You know, Saul's a really curious individual in the Bible because as we go, you're going to see he doesn't really live for the Lord at all despite this event that we're seeing. In fact, in chapter 15, we're told that he rejected the Word of God. And there's no real fruit from his conversion, if that's what this is. There's no proof of a new nature that I see in you people. He doesn't really seek the Lord in his life. We don't see repentance, really, or belief that we see in some of the other Old Testament saints. But the most compelling thing to me is this. Remember when we began 1 Samuel, we talked about how this whole book of 1 Samuel is comparing the life of the flesh with the life of the Spirit. Saul represents the life of the flesh, the old man. Whereas David, where we'll see here in a few chapters, he represents the life of the spirit, the new man. And so there's a lot of compelling things here about it and conflicting. It sure looks like he's saved on the surface, but I'm not so sure about the evidence that we see in the rest of Scripture. Beyond that, my question becomes, why is there so much detail and attention paid to this event. What does the Lord want us to know from this? Well, ultimately, God alone knows who's saved and who isn't. And this should, all of us, to be sure of our own salvation and then be concerned about those people that are around us. I can be assured of who I am in Jesus Christ because the Bible says so. It gives a nice, succinct description in 1 John 5. It says, And John's speaking, he says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. It's very clear. And those of us that receive that can know that we have eternal life. There is no doubt. We just know because it says so. You know that you know because you know. (laughs) I don't know about Saul. He's been dead a long time. I don't know what happened to Saul. But what I'm concerned about is you guys, my neighbors, my extended family, these people that are here now, That's who I'm concerned. I think that's who we should be concerned about too. We all need a new heart. (laughs) And there's only one way to get it. And it's through faith in God. He said, he told Ezekiel that I will give them a new heart. Speaking about these last days, that I will put a new spirit within my people. 
take the stony heart out and replace it with the heart of flesh. That's what God does. Heart surgery for people, replacing the old one with the new. And so that's my prayer. I hope that's your prayer too for every person in Meridian, people that walk in here. You could be one of those people today. Maybe you're here. I am not. I don't know all of you, but if you haven't turned your life over to Jesus Christ, He's speaking to you right now. He wants to give you a new heart so that you can have eternal life. Do you have the Son? He's who sets you free. So we go on now. It says in verses 10 through 13, when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them, just like it said. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And when they had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Where it says the Spirit of God came upon him, in the original language, it's the Spirit of God rushed upon him. If you could just kind of think of it that way. And so again, (laughs) there's some compelling Old Testament experience here that I can't really figure out but something remarkable has happened to Saul and so what we see is the first thing him to do is he actually obeys the Lord in faith remember do as the occasion demands and the occasion demands him to do this and he actually does it but what happens to him what does it say happens he's ridiculed right because of his faith it says by those who knew him formerly it's out of character for Saul to do this. They knew what Saul used to be like, and now here's this new Saul, and it's like, what is he doing? This isn't Saul. So he actually becomes a proverb (laughs) about him. It's sort of like when a worldly person changes that maybe you've seen. You've got this guy who, for no explanation that the world can figure out, is yesterday he was smoking pot and cursing, (laughs) and today he's smiling and handing out tracts at the mall. (laughs) playing a guitar and evangelizing to people. And they're like, what has happened to this guy? But of course, not everybody's going to get behind that kind of a change. It happened to Jesus. Jesus warned and said, you know, a prophet is despised in his own country. And it's because people know what some were like before and they start to follow in faith what God calls them to do. And not everybody is going to like that. Having faith in God and doing what he tells you to do will sometimes get you ridiculed. And this is why faith sometimes will run dry in a person because of things like this. But remember, God is with you. God is with you. Jesus said in in John chapter 14, I'm going to leave my helper to abide with you. He will abide with you forever and never leave you. And so we have the Holy Spirit with us as Christians. God is with us literally everywhere that we go. And so we need not be afraid, even if, if there is some ridicule for your faith. Then Saul's uncle said to him, verse 14, and his servant, where did you go? So he said, to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me please what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. He just told me where the donkeys are. Well, why is your hair all oily, Saul? <laughs> Wish you'd have said that. I'm wondering why Saul doesn't share this. Maybe he was being humble instead of going, I'm the king! <laughs> you know, he could have done that, because he was. But maybe he's being humble. But I think more likely is, is that he's already had enough <laughs> of this business already. I've tried faith, <laughs> and I got sort of teased about it, and now I'm not going to do it. Fear is starting to take over in his life. He's resisting the call that God has on him. And we're going to see more of that. It says, Then Samuel called the people, verse 17, together to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversaries and your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. 
And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So the Lord does a little review here of the things that have happened up to this point. It's like he's saying, okay, (laughs) let's just have a little dose of reality here about how we've arrived at this situation. Despite what I've shown you and done for you and promised you, you wanted the king. Everybody all agreed on that? That's what you want. So then he begins to have Saul, Samuel does have the these tribes of Israel come by. First Benjamin comes because Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. And then it whittles down to a certain family within that tribe. And then finally, Samuel makes it clear that Saul is the chosen king. But there's no guest of honor. So let's see what happened. It says in verse 22, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has this man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. (laughs) Where's King Saul? He's over there behind the wagons. (laughs) Picture just for a minute at a presidential inauguration. It's CNN's covering it. There's millions of people watching. All of downtown Washington is filled with people. And you've got the... The chief justice of the Supreme Court walks up there with the Bible in his hand, ready to swear him in. And where's the president? (laughs) Oh, he's over there behind the hot dog stand. It's the same kind of curious thing that would happen. It's not a really great way to start the first day on the job. And so here's Saul, and obviously he's got some self-doubt. Uh, Maybe he's nervous about what he knows. Remember, Samuel explained to him what the expectation was for a king in our last study. And so perhaps he's just really nervous about it, but I think even more so that he just doesn't want to do it. Maybe he wanted to live his life that he had before. This is what we have to be ready for when God calls us because the old way all of a sudden seems a lot less of a hassle than what the Lord wants us to do, to swim upstream against these things. He wants to live his life his own way. Remember, he had a wealthy family. He had a lot of natural things going for him. And so he decided not to. And he wouldn't be the first or the last to do this. Because this is kind of the default in God's kingdom. Don't use me. Kind of just like it the way things are. This lack of vision. This lack of faith. And I think a lot of it comes from a lack of relationship that we have. As we grow in our relationship with the Lord, we will want Him to use us. G. Campbell Morgan said, If God calls us, we have no right to hide away. (laughs) And I agree with that. The Bible says that it's our reasonable service to allow Him to just take over my life. It's the least I can do for all that He's done for me. We were at this concert the other night with a few of the kids from the church and it was that rock and worship road show i know some of you uh, went to that but i was just so encouraged by the young people loving the lord and and these these bands that were you know even though it was kind of a concert and a performance it was also a worship time i just sensed that when i was there but there was one of the guys and i can't remember who it was specifically but they had these this big screen on the back uh, of the stage And they were flashed the the lyrics and pictures and so forth. And one of the guys was talking and it just kept saying, Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. And I've just been thinking about that ever since. Because how many of us are saying that? That guy was in that moment. At least it sounded like he was. But how many of us in faith are really saying that? Use me, Lord. That's what God calls us for. It says, so they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? That there is none like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. This is God save the queen. (laughs) Uh, Go back a few thousand years ago. That's where this expression originated from. Still in use today. And they're just really enthusiastic about this guy. J. Vernon McGee said that God needs to save these people also. (laughs) Only he would have said it in a southern drawl that was funnier than that. (laughs) God saved the people, not just the king. So here's God. He's picking him out. But the people 
chose him. They wanted him. And it doesn't matter how enthusiastic that they are. It won't replace their need for God. And it won't replace our need for God either. No matter how enthusiastic that we get about someone or something, a, a president or our leaders or a job or a person or our life, a, whatever, none of that stuff replaces our need for God to rule over us. And that's what they truly needed and what they should have really clamored after instead of this king. So let's finish verses 25 to 27. It says, Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Well, the opposition really takes hold in a hurry, doesn't it? Early on, we see these rebels. In the original language, one way to translate it is hellions. If that gives you any idea of what these guys are like. Hellions against him. They're saying, he's got no military background. How's he going to help us fight the Philistines? And so, opposition. And you know what? There is always going to be opposition to God's work. Even in the church. There's opposition all the time to the work that God wants to do. But we have to have faith to press on to whatever he's called us to do. It might be something in the moment. We're responding to that truck of senior citizens pulling up alongside the car or whatever it is that God has for you. But I wanted to just finish off with positive note here. There's these valiant men. We've got the rebels, okay? There's opposition. But there's valiant men, these men who went with him. It says who the hearts whose God had touched. And I see men like that in our church. Guys serving and praying and wanting to make a difference. Honorable men, husbands, fathers in our community, business owners that want to make a difference and want to be faithful to what God has called them to. And I think that's exciting. That's one of the most exciting things about being the pastor of this church is to watch God work through the men. Nothing against the ladies. Love the ladies in the church. But... God needs to grip the hearts of the men. It's essential. They're the spiritual leaders in the families and everything. And so when men are fully committed to Jesus Christ, there's unlimited potential. And so we need to be praying that God would grip the hearts of the men in this town, in this church. And so we need more faith. (laughs) I think we can all agree on that. Lots of it. We need the gift of faith. I pray for the gift of faith in my own life from the Lord. Maybe you could join me in doing that, praying for you to have the gift of faith. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. We need that faith from you. And pray that God gets a hold of our hearts as we exercise that faith in Him. I want to finish up with just a brief little story about Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary to China. Hudson Taylor went to China And he was making the voyage on this uh, sailing vessel. And as it neared land, the missionary heard this urgent knock on the door of his stateroom. And he opened it, and the captain was standing there in the hallway. And he said, Mr. Taylor, we have no wind. And we are drifting toward an island where the people there are heathen. And I fear that they might be cannibals. And so Hudson Taylor said, well, what can I do? And he said, well, I understand that you believe in God. I want you to pray for wind. And he said, all right, Captain, I will. But first you must set the sail. And the captain said, what? That's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze. Besides, the sailors will think I'm crazy. (laughs) But Taylor insisted, and then the captain finally relented. So 45 minutes later, the captain comes back to the stateroom and knocks on the door, and he finds Hudson Taylor still on his knees praying. And he says, Mr. Taylor, you can stop praying now. We've got more wind than we know what to do with. (laughs) That's the life of a believer. He was living by faith already, and then when the occasion presented itself, he was ready to believe and trust in the Lord, even if it required him to look maybe silly. And so faith is a way of life. But I want to encourage you as we just finish up here that God is with you and he will help you. So let's stand and pray.